everybody. Welcome to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation's 2021 virtual annual conference presentation. Today's event is the fifth in a series over the summer and fall highlighting the researchers who work with SPF to find a cure for HSP and PLS. We are using the Zoom webinar platform today, so you can't see, we can't see or hear you, but we know that you are with us. Our guest speaker today will be answering some of your questions during his presentation, so you must use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your Zoom screen to send in your questions. Please don't use the chat box, okay? Um, also, we are collecting your questions today, so if we don't get to all of them, um, our guests will try to answer them at a later date. Please note that we are recording today's virtual conference presentation. It will be available on the SPF YouTube channel very shortly. Hey, while well, I got a couple of seconds, I wanted to talk to everybody about the SPF store. If you go to our website, sp-foundation.org and you roll the page all the way up and down at the bottom you'll see an image of a store click on that and that'll take you to a website where you can buy items with the SPF logo on it and stuff so you can wear around when you're doing things when you're out meeting people or you're you're wearing it to go to the store or just around the house you can see I'm wearing a t-shirt right here one of our famous uh, our logo that is on t-shirts you get to wear What's also real cool is we've got a lot of different designs out there. Here's one right now that says, break the code, find a cure. Pretty cool. And you can get these in different colors of material, different color shirts too. Here's another one. This is one, this is my favorite right now. This is a new one we had designed, HSP Warrior. Isn't that really cool? Really good looking? Really nice looking shirt that you can wear out and you can, uh, you can give them as gifts. Uh, uh, on holidays or for birthdays, or you can just wear them around and look good and people will ask you about the foundation because they're seeing what you're wearing. Here's a really, really neat one right now that we've got available too. This is like a crossword, okay? You guys have all done crossword puzzles and stuff. There's some questions and answers and how to fill it out. Really neat, once again, any color that you like. Here's another one with a nice design on it here. Look at this guy, okay? SPF, got the foundation, got the hashtag on it, got the website, wear this out, you're a walking billboard and you look good while you're doing it. And what's also real neat is you can get them in different lengths. This is a short sleeve shirt here. You can also get the same on a long sleeve, okay, for, for winter, okay. Get the same design on a different color shirt and a long sleeve. The more the merrier we've got tons of these around my house plus you can get other items you can get phone cases and you can get a whole bunch of other different items and put the logo on like i said give them away is um as gifts and stuff for birthdays or just wear them around or it's just so that you're getting awareness and by the way the foundation gets uh, uh, a couple of dollars back for every sale that's made on that website okay so you're helping the foundation at the same time okay really really good Okay, real quick, we're going to do a quick review. Remember today to, to ask a question, you got to use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your uh, Zoom screen, okay? Type your question in there and we'll get to see it and we'll get it to the doctor and he'll be able to answer that, okay? Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, Mr. Frank Davis. Frank? Hello everyone. It is my distinct honor and pleasure today to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Marcondis C. Franca Jr. PhD. In the last few years, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation has been working with neuro neurological scientists in Brazil and this has resulted in us having a great number of members join us who live in Brazil. It makes me wonder how we could be how we could be opening the door to people in still more countries if we could work with neurologists in those countries to get connected to their patients. If any one of you in countries outside of the United States work with a neurologist that works with other HSP and PLS patients in your country, please email us their name at information at sp-foundation.org. Again, that's information at sp, like Sally Paul, dash foundation.org to let us know. 
then we will try to set up communication with any doctors you refer us to, to open the door to working with more patients in more countries. As time goes on, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation has become more and more of an international foundation, working with people with HSP and PLS all over this planet. Dr. Franca is the Director of Neurogenetics Program at the University of Campinas, or UNICAMP, in Brazil. UNICAMP is a public research university in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. UNICAMP is consistently ranked among the top universities in Brazil and Latin America. Established in 1962, UNICAMP was designed from scratch as an integrated research center. Its research, its research focuses, focus reflects on almost half of its students being graduate students. The largest proportion across all large universities in Brazil and also reflects the large number of graduate programs it offers. 153 graduate programs. Its main campus occupies 860 acres, which is pretty large to me. It also has three satellite campuses. Like other Brazilian public universities, no tuition fees or administrative fees are charged for undergraduate and graduate programs. Unicamp is responsible for around 15% of Brazilian research a disproportionately high number when compared to much larger and older institutions in the country. It also produces more patents than any other research organization in Brazil. Multiple international university rankings place it amongst the best universities in the world. In 2015, it was rated as the best university in the country by Brazil's Ministry of Education. Dr. Franca is a neuro neurologist with a PhD in neurogenetics. Neuro neurogenetics. He has been involved in clinical care and research with hereditary spastic paraplegia since 2008. He follows more than 300 patients with HSP from different regions of Brazil. His group is active in the investigation of biomarkers for HSP, particularly neuroimaging. He led the first randomized clinical trial using Botox in HSP. Dr. Frank Franca will be speaking today about anti-spastic therapies in hereditary spastic paraplegias and the results of two clinical trials of symptomatic therapies for HSPs using Botox and oil of Aplenia Zurambet and their initial results using spinal cord neuromodulation. Join me in welcoming Dr. Marcondes C. Franca, Jr. Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be here joining this initiative from the Fast Propagia Foundation. I'm, I'm really honored to, to, be, to be part of this, of this educational uh, program. And I'd like to, to, to thank for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, so um, I'm gonna share now my slides and uh, we can then begin to have the discussions about this topic. Um, I hope everybody can see the, the slides. And as previously, previously mentioned, so I'm going to focus a little bit on antispastic therapies for HSPs. Uh, this, is, this is a subject that uh, our group has been uh, working on for the past uh, year. So we, we, we run two, two clinical trials, trying to explore the potential effectiveness of that kind of approach. And one of those studies has been already published this year. I'm going to share the, the result with you. And the other one uh, we have, have uh, finished quite recently and I'm going to show you some un unpublished data at this point. And finally, I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, neuromodulation, which is another approach we, be we began to, to evaluate. And I really believe that might be uh, useful uh, to, to help uh, the, in the management of, of, the, of the disease. Well, so these are my disclosures. So basically I've, I've got no disclosure for this particular talk, but I'd like to, to highlight that some of the studies that I'm gonna present here uh, were supported by Brazilian governmental uh, research agencies, but also we've got some support from Brazilian uh, pharmaceutical companies. So Cristalian and Nebron has been, have, been, have, have helped us uh, to, to uh, implement the clinical trials. So I'd like to make this point clear. And as I mentioned previously, so I think these are the two major learning objectives I'd like to, to bring to you in this the discussion. So first, I'd like to, to briefly review the role of spasticity in HSPs. 
and basically to review how how I mean uh, impactful it can be. And then I think the, the most uh, relevant part of the talk, we're going to discuss a little bit about some management options uh, for specificity. And I'm going to, to drive your attention to botulinum toxin, uh, to, to this uh, uh, new medication, which is the oil of this uh, um, uh, plant. So opinia zerumbet. And then I want to talk a little bit about neuromodulation. Well, so uh, to, to begin, uh, I'd like to just to give you some introduction about the, the place where I work. So I think uh, I, uh, we had, we had uh, some introduction about UNICAP, but just to give you an idea. So UNICAP is based here in the southeastern part of Brazil, so in the city of Campinas. So we're based in the state of Sao Paulo, which is the largest and, and most uh, um, uh, well-structured state in the country. And our hospital is a national reference center for rare diseases especially those with a genetic background. And my group in particular is involved uh, in, the, in the clinical care and research uh, of patients with HSPs. So currently, this is uh, an outline of our, our cohort uh, under regular follow-up. So we've got now more than 300 patients uh, under our, our clinical care at, at, at the Unicamp Hospital. So this is a, a, a general a scenario about the distribution of the different HS, uh, HSP subtypes. So as you can appreciate here, SPG4 is, is uh, the most, the most uh, frequent subtype, but we also got large cohorts of SPG11, SPG7, SPG3A, and also some other patients that have a, a, a phenotype that resembles HSP, but uh, actually had different genetic diagnoses such as uh, conditions such as um, uh, prion like disease and some leukodystrophy. So this is to give you an idea about our, our, our center in our uh, uh, cohort of patients that we have been following. Well, so uh, now turning to, to the, the, the topic we're going to discuss. So I'd like to begin uh, reminding you of the history of HSPs. So since the very first descriptions done by Adolf Strempel in the late 90s, uh, so he, he called attention to, I would say, four uh, 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 important points about this condition. So he called the disease at, at that point hereditary spastic spinal paralysis, and he, he called attention to the lower limb weakness, to the progressive course, to the, the presence of a positive family history, so other relatives uh, uh, showing the similar symptoms, but he also called our attention at that point to the presence of spasticity. So uh, this is something I'd like to, to, to remind you. So spasticity is not only one of the hallmarks of the, of the disease, but I would say it's possibly one of the most of, uh, important causes for the, the gait disturbance and some other manifestations like pain, like cramps. So um, it, it's an important part of the, of the whole uh, of, uh, phenotype of the disease. Well, um, HSP, HSPs in general uh, are caused by uh, damage to, to the uh, spinal cord, uh, uh, corticospinal tract projections within the spinal cord. So we now uh, understand this condition as an, a dying back uh, kind of neuropathy. So we begin to see the generation of these lung projections. So it really begins in the lower portions of the spinal cord. And then the, as the uh, disease progresses, we begin to see uh, an upward progression of this kind of degeneration. And one of the main consequences of this uh, uh, degeneration is the um, abnormal modulation of the uh, spinal uh, reflexes. So here is a really, uh, I mean, simple uh, 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 schematic representation of the spinal uh, uh, arc reflex. So as you can see here in blue, we got the sensory efferent pathway that comes from muscles, from the skin. So it comes uh, uh, in peripheral nerves and then it, it enters the spinal cord through the posterior roots. And, and then it, it has a, an integration and a synapse with the motor, uh, uh, with the alpha motor neurons that you can see here uh, uh, represented in, in pink. Well, this is the uh, purely, uh, I would say, peripheral neural pathway. But if you can look carefully here in the arrowhead, then you can see that the uh, uh, corticospinal tracts, it has a projection 
that somehow modulates the, this kind of integration between sensory and, and motor uh, peripheral uh, uh, pathways. And what happens in patients with HSPs and, and PLS as well, is that uh, due to the, the generation of these uh, corticospinal neurons, we begin to see an abnormal regulation of this, uh, um, uh, of this integration within spinal cord. So the clinical consequence of, of this is spasticity, which is basically uh, seen in, in terms of clinical evaluations as an increase in muscle tone, an increase in deep tendon reflexes, abnormal postures, especially in the, in the feet, and also pain, which is a, a frequent um, clinical uh, counterpart of these, of these type of disease. Well, now we can appreciate here, this is, um, this is a video from one of my patients and um, I think many of you here in, in the audience, uh, of course, know and, and are familiar with this kind of, of, of abnormal gait. But here, you can appreciate that the patient has a, a quite evident difficulty, for example, to um, uh, uh, flex the knees, to properly move the feet. And much of this uh, difficulty comes from uh, the spasticity uh, that I previously mentioned to you. So uh, my particular view is that spasticity is a major cause of gait disturbance in HSPs. So here you can see in this cartoon, uh, a kind of representation of the, of the, the normal gait in, in a person um, without any kind of neurological disease. And what happens here is that patients with HSPs, uh, for example, when we think about cough spasticity, then this uh, interferes, for example, in the stance phase of the normal gait. So basically uh, the feet can no longer properly, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, reach the ground. And this obviously uh, interferes with the propulsive phase of the gait. Uh, a similar phenomenon takes place when we think about tight spasticity. So patients, as you, as you have seen previously in, in the video, are not able to, to flex the knee properly. And this of course uh, also interferes with the, the uh, gait velocity. Uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, gait functioning uh, overall. So uh, taking those considerations into account, we, we believe that if we can somehow relieve uh, spasticity, uh, then we might have some clinical benefit. And this is something we, we have been trying to, to investigate uh, in, our clinic, in our research group here at, at the University of Campinas. So uh, when you think about the available management options for spasticity in general, not only uh, uh, related to, to HSP, but also to other diseases like, I mean, stroke or spinal cord injury, whatever. So we, we now have many different options beginning uh, with uh, non-pharmacological interventions like stretching, splinting, and, and proper positioning of, of, the, of the affected limb, for example. So this is a, basically a physical therapy approach but we also have now other different options. So when you think about pharmacological options, we now got some oral medications, we now got um, uh, botulinum toxin injections and, and other approaches. Uh, as, a, as a last step, we also have some surgical options that include, for example, some, some uh, um, spinal cord uh, uh, surgical approaches and also uh, the placement of intratecal baclofen pumps, for example. And you know, thinking about all these uh, these options we have to 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 manage spasticity, what is the, the scenario we, we have uh, at this point in terms of HSP? So uh, I'm pretty confident that um, many of you and our relatives have been offered and have been prescribed some of these options to treat spasticity, and this is what we we also do here in our in our hospital. But when we, when, we, when we come to, to see in more detail the available evidence, we have some, I mean, uh, we have some great limitations. Uh, the first one is that uh, there are not really good data at, at this point. So there are only small series published so far. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear uh, uh, that these, these approaches are, 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 have, have, have clinical benefit. And also um, there are some, some safety concerns, at least uh, some of my patients and some publications have raised concerns about drowsiness, weakness that might happen with some of these, uh, these therapeutic options. So thinking about the, the current scenario we have for HSPs, so we, we, we thought that um, 
we need to have more research and we need to provide more reliable data showing uh, whether this kind of option is really effective and is, is uh, uh, safe uh, as, an, as an, a therapeutic option for HSPs. So with that idea in mind, we, we then began to, to, to try to implement so uh, clinical trials and to have definitive answers to, to that question. And, and at this point, I'd like to remind you that due to many factors, but certainly one of those, uh, one of those important factors is the rarity of the, of the condition. So we basically do not have, or we did not have at least uh, until very, very recently. So randomized, well-designed clinical trials uh, exploring uh, different therapies for HSPs. So we tried to, to, to uh, uh, move forward. And the initial uh, approach we tried to investigate was uh, the use of botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin is now a quite, I would say, familiar uh, uh, medication. I think many of you have heard about this and even may have uh, used botulinum toxin. But just to remind some of you, uh, botulinum toxin is a, is a protein, is a toxin that comes from the, the, the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. And uh, essentially what this, this protein, uh, what it does is that it interferes with the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So it basically blocks the connection between uh, peripheral motor nerves and skeletal muscles. So it has a really strong uh, spasmolytic effect and for that reason, and, and based in many, many clinical trials, it has been now approved by, by FDA and by other agencies all over the world to, to manage diseases uh, characterized by spasticity. But you know, despite that, uh, it's not yet approved for management of spastic paraplegia. So it's not clear at this point if, if botulinum toxin is indeed effective to manage or to at least partially uh, a relief uh, manifestations related to, to, to HSP. When we come to see uh, the literature, so I, I tried here to summarize, uh, uh, I think the, the most relevant papers published so far. So you can appreciate here, we have uh, four different publications. Uh, most of those publications uh, came out from European or American centers, but uh, all of them, uh, the sample size is not really uh, uh, large. So uh, between 12 uh, and 19 patients with different profiles. So in many uh, of these publications, we, we did not have, for example, genetic definition of the disease uh, of the subtypes at least. And we also had some uh, heterogeneity in terms of the, the patients that have been tested. So in some of these studies, Authors were able to recruit patients with pure HSP uh, only, but in other studies, they mixed uh, patients with pure and, and, and complex uh, HSPs. So this is a, a real limitation. And, we come to, and when we come to see the main findings uh, of each of these studies, there is also some um, variability in terms of the main findings. So uh, overall, there was a trend towards improvement but it was not quite uh, um, homogeneous uh, across the different publications. So in some of these studies, authors were able to find um, improvement in spasticity, but uh, gait improvement, which is the actual uh, goal uh, we would like to see here, was not quite, uh, um, uh, quite uh, evident. So some studies, there was gait improvement, but others did not. Well, so taking into account these, these limitations, we then try to, to overcome them and, and to, to really move forward. And then we designed this, this study, which has recently been published in Movement Disorders. So this is the SPASTOX trial. And this is, uh, I would say, the very first randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial trying to evaluate the effects of botulinum toxin type A in, in a, a large cohort of patients with hereditary spastic paraplegia. So in brief, you can appreciate here how this study was designed. So it, was, it, it has been registered in clinicaltrials.gov, and this is basically the outline of what we did. So we initially screened more than 150 patients. For many reasons, uh, we, 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 ha we had patients which, which were not eligible uh, at all. And then we were left with 55 subjects that uh, were ultimately enrolled in this clinical trial. So these individuals were randomized 
So we had two different uh, uh, groups. So the first one uh, with 27 subjects, uh, they received intramuscular botulinum toxin injections in the other group, uh, initially 28 subjects, they received intramuscular placebo injections. So these individuals were followed. So we, we had the second visit, uh, the second evaluation done eight weeks after the first injection. And then uh, sometime later, so after 24 to 28 weeks, we had a crossover. So the group uh, that initially received placebo then received, uh, um, received botulinum toxin and the opposite also took place. So uh, we had the crossover. These individuals were then followed for eight weeks. And by the end of the, of the uh, follow-up period, we had the, the analysis of the final results. Well, um, we, 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 we chose uh, two muscles uh, as our targets uh, to receive the botulinum toxin injections. So the, the, the medial part of the leg, so the adductor mu muscles, and also the hamstring muscles here, uh, the calf muscles here, as you can see uh, in, this, in this patient. Well, so uh, we now, we're now gonna show you the, the, the final results. So unfortunately, uh, this, this has been a negative trial. So even though we, we found um, uh, a positive result in terms of uh, the spasticity, so as you can see here, the medication really improved spasticity in these patients. When we come to see the, the primary outcome measure, which has been uh, gait velocity. So in, in here in A, you can appreciate the maximal gait velocity. And in B, you can see here the comfortable self-selected gait velocity. And then in both uh, 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 box plots, you can see here uh, in, in red, the, the values uh, before the injection and in green, the values after the injection. So. Uh, you can see that it's, we, we, we actually saw some, some mild improvement after botulinum toxin, whether in the placebo group there was some decline, but this did not reach uh, uh, the threshold to reach uh, significance. So uh, in the end, this has been a, a negative res uh, result in terms of the clinical efficacy, but uh, in terms of the safety of the, of the therapy. So you can appreciate that uh, considering all possible adverse events, we found uh, a similar proportion of the findings when we compared uh, the group that received with botulinum toxin and the group that received placebo. So uh, in the end, we're able to, to show that botulinum toxin was uh, safe using this, this injection protocol it was able to relieve spasticity, but unfortunately it did not uh, uh, lead, lead to um, improvement in terms of the gait velocity in, in, in patients with HSP. Well, then uh, we move it to a second approach and then we, we evaluated now uh, a medication uh, that acts at the motor point. So uh, the medication comes uh, from this, this plant. So it's called Alpinia Zerumbet. So we actually uh, employed the essential oil of this, of this plant. So it, it's, its brand name is called Ziklag in Brazil. Uh, this medication has been recently approved by our, our uh, national regulatory agents as an antispastic agent for patients with uh, cerebral palsy and stroke. And when you come to, to look at the uh, basic pharmacology of this compound, we now know that it inhibits L-type calcium channels, which is an important protein in the process of muscle contraction. So it's, it's a kind of a antispastic agent that acts at the muscle level. So it's, not a, it's, it's a little bit different from botulinum toxin, which acts at the interface between nerve and muscle. And here it's a, it's a, it's a topical compound. So it's basically used through the skin which is more, much more convenient, especially for kids. And it has a really, uh, at least in terms of the, the, the uh, laboratory research, uh, quite effective uh, effects in both skeletal and smooth muscles. So taking this uh, uh, preclinical data into approach, then we, we, we designed the, 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 the trial. So the, this, this trial, we call it ZISPAS trial. And uh, you can see here that the, the design was very similar to the previous study. So we're able to, to recruit 56 subjects. So these individuals were randomized into two groups. So 
The first one uh, that included 27 subjects receiving the essential oil of the, of the plant, so receiving the zinc clog, and the other group received placebo. So these individuals uh, then uh, took the medication uh, on a daily basis. So they received the, the, the buffs, the injections of the, of the oil uh, uh, over the skin. Mm -hmm. Then after four weeks, they were evaluated. And soon after that, they, they went, they, they had the crossover after 16 weeks. And then we had the, the same scenario we had in the previous trial. So uh, the patients who received placebo then began to receive the medication and, and uh, the same, the opposite took place in the other group. So after four weeks, we, we saw the, the results and this has been a slightly, uh, I would say shorter clinical trial. And uh, we, we again focused our, our uh, interventions in two muscle groups. So triceps ralis, which, is the, which are the cough muscles, and also the adductors. So every single patient received the maximal dose uh, following the, the local approval of the medication. So that means every patient received four uh, uh, puffs of, of, the, of the oil. And again, we took into consideration as our primary outcome measure, uh, the, the maximal uh, gait speed considering uh, 10 meters of, of distance. Well, and again, unfortunately, we also had a negative results. So this is unpublished data. We, we have just finished the analysis of this trial. And here you can appreciate the, the maximal gate velocity uh, for both groups. So placebo in green and uh, in, in, in orange here, the, the, the active group with z -clog. And you know, again, you can see that we, we found no, no significant difference in terms of uh, a gait uh, of velocity. Uh, the same took place considering the self-selected comfortable gait velocity. So again, no, no significant difference. And in contrast to the previous trial with botulinum toxin, here we could not see uh, any significant change in terms of spasticity or, or force. Uh, interestingly, we, we, when you look at the secondary outcome measures, we're beginning to, to evaluate those, those data. So we don't have the final evaluation at this point yet, but considering self, the patient's self-perception of improvement, so we actually found a trend towards improvement uh, uh, using this medication. So uh, essentially the, the, the primary outcome measure was a negative. So uh, z -clock could not improve a, a gait of, of our patients, but it's possible that the medication has some other uh, 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 positive effects in non-motor uh, manifestations. So I'm talking about pain, fatigue, and uh, overall uh, general perception of improvement. So, uh, we're gonna we're gonna finish these analysis hopefully in the coming weeks, and then we might we might have a more uh, a comprehensive scenario of the uh, potential role of that medication. Well, so now coming to the to the last portion of the of the talk, then I'm gonna shift towards uh, electrical stimulation. So we're, we're, I'm now gonna show you some initial results uh, we have using neuromodulation as a, a possible strategy to, to, uh, to manage and to help patients with uh, HSPs. Well, neuromodulation is now, uh, I would say, quite uh, established uh, uh, approach in many neurological diseases. But uh, to, to give you a, 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 a I mean, summary of the, of the technology, so a neuromodulation involves uh, different technological approaches that basically aim to modulate nervous system function. And this, has, this can be done either uh, 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 in brain or, or in the spinal cord. And this obviously depends on the specific condition you're interested in, in, in improving. And uh, depending on the approach, uh, neuromodulation can have either uh, a positive effect. So, I mean, it can have uh, excitatory uh, action within uh, neural pathways, or it can also have the opposite effect uh, that is, uh, it can has an uh, in inhibitory effect over uh, some uh, um, neural regions. And these uh, final uh, uh, effects can be uh, accomplished using either electrical or magnetical stimulation over specific central nervous system regions. So taking into account this general concept of neuromodulation, we can uh, understand that it has a, a different, uh, uh, I mean, 
different uh, uses. So one, one, one important difference here uh, is about the, the, the placement of the stimulating electrode. So we have what we call invasive neuromodulation. So this is a, a, a kind of, of, of approach that usually needs a surgical intervention so that we can place the, the stimulating electrodes in close contact to the brain, to the spinal cord. So this, this is sometimes more effective because you're able to reach the target region more uh, effectively. But of course, as you depend on a surgical intervention, this has more risks uh, involved with the, 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 the procedure. And the other approach, which is much more, I would say, uh, safe and uh, easy to perform is what we call non-invasive neuromodulation. So uh, in, this, in this different scenario, we, we uh, use uh, different uh, uh, devices. As you can see here in this cartoon, you can use, for example, uh, skin uh, electrodes to deliver electrical stim stimuli, or you can use this kind of uh, an eight like a, a, a coil, which delivers, for example, magnetic stimulation to a specific brain or spinal cord regions. Um, and, and I mean, considering all the different approaches we have now for, for neuromodulation, we now have some uh, already approved indications. So as you can see here in this, in this cartoon, so here in the, in the left side of the, of the slide, you can see that for some conditions, uh, for example, for Parkinson's disease, for essential tremor, we now have a, a clear indication to use a deep brain stimulation. Uh, for example, for, for profound deafness, so it's now uh, uh, clear that uh, cochlear implants are, are helpful to patients. And for other different neurological diseases, such as epilepsy, such as chronic pain, uh, we, we have the options to, to, to use um, this kind of uh, therapeutic approach. But uh, when, we, when we think about spasticity, we, we now have some, some publications but we, we do not have definite evidence that it, it is, it is uh, uh, I mean, beneficial for patients. And when we, when we come to the discussion uh, to HSPs or in, more, in a more general sense about spinal cord blade specificity, so we're now beginning to see some very interesting results. And this is something I'd like to show you in, in the coming uh, slides. So uh, when, when, we, when we discuss a little bit about the use of neuromodulation to manage spinal cord related specificity, we have, uh, again, two different approaches. So as I mentioned to you previously, we have this non-invasive approach, which involves the, the placement of electrical spinal cord stimulation. So as you can see here, use a kind of a, a, a skin uh, electrode, which is placed uh, in, in the paraspinal muscles which is something much more, uh, much more uh, uh, accessible uh, to, to the patients. And we, we, you, you can also uh, use this epid epidural spinal cord stimulation, which is an invasive technique that relies upon the placement of these uh, kind of uh, um, battery and this uh, 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 stimulation electrode placed within uh, the, the epidural region. So uh, most of the available data uh, so far come from, comes from patients affected by spinal cord injuries. So this is one of the very first publications. Here you can see a patient that has been treated using these um, transcutaneous stimulation, so a non-invasive approach. And uh, this patient was essentially a, a paraplegic, so she was not able to move uh, the lower limb muscles uh, uh, at all. And as you can see here, using the, the, the stimulation and using recording electrodes placed in, in low limb muscles, you can see that uh, uh, an, an electrical signal could be obtained. And this resulted in, uh, in uh, clinical uh, movement. So she began to notice some uh, improvement in her uh, low limb function. And this has been really, I mean, important for her since she was not able to move the legs after the, the, the trauma. More recently, this is a, a really, a, I would say, a landmark publication that came out in the England Journal of Medicine, showing really uh, showing severe uh, patients with uh, severe spinal cord injuries, so uh, that were able to 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 regain the ability to stand uh, and even to walk using invasive uh, epidural stimulations. 
So this is a, 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 a quite impressive video. So this patient that you can see here, uh, of course, he needs uh, help and he needs to be supported to, to walk. But this was something really, uh, I mean, amazing in, in a scenario uh, of, of patients with severe spinal cord injury. So these initial publications are really, I mean, uh, exciting because we, we, we see that neuromodulation uh, is, is uh, a potential approach to, to help uh, spinal cord related spasticity. In terms of uh, HSPs, uh, of course, we, we don't have as much uh, data uh, published so far, but again, recently we're able to see one interesting patient. So this has been one of our uh, most severely affected patients with SPG4. So she was still able to walk, but um, and she was really disabled because of the disease. And in addition to the motor uh, difficulties she faced, uh, she also had severe uh, pain. We, we tried to manage her with different medications, but you know, we're not able to, to, to actually uh, relieve pain. And then we discussed it with her in our neurosurgical team, and we, we, we decided to, to move forward and, um, uh, and, and perform a surgical implantation of an epidural stim stimulator for this patient. So here, uh, the, the initial reason for, for the, the, the procedure was actually the improvement of pain, which was uh, really uh, uh, severe for her. Here you can see the placement of the, of the electrodes. So again, this is a surgical procedure, and this is an invasive uh, uh, ele electrical uh, stimulation uh, uh, approach. And what we faced was really uh, surprising for us. So the patient actually had a, a pain improvement. So we were able to, to taper some of her uh, uh, pain medications. But in addition to that improvement, we were able to see some uh, really amazing motor improvement. So here you can see here the, the, the clinic evaluation. So uh, this is the, 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 the zero here is the, the, the baseline evaluation. So at the time, just, just prior to the surgical procedure. And you can see here in, the, in this uh, uh, graph, so this is the SPRS score, which is a, a, a clinical score we use to evaluate the severity of spastic paraplegia. So uh, uh, essentially what we see here is that uh, patients that are not treated at all, after 24 months, they have this kind of worsening of the motor function. That is, the, the scores are, are going up. And our patient, you know, after one to, to six months, she had a really significant decline in, in her SPRS score. So showing that the motor function actually improved. And here in the, in the lower portion of the slide, you can appreciate here that uh, using this uh, kind of uh, quantitative uh, of force evaluation. So when we use the stimulation and, and depending on the intensity of the, of the electrical stimuli. So you can see here in red that she got really improved strength, uh, especially looking at the uh, proximal muscles of the of the legs uh, i think I, I think looking at this video here is i think it's much more much more uh interesting to oh, i'm sorry it's much more uh, interesting to see the, the difference so this is a video we asked her to perform a dorsiflexion of the of the feet so you can appreciate here that she's able to move the the the, the, the toes actually but dorsiflexion was really, really hard for her to perform. And uh, uh, here you can see the other video with the simulator turned on. And I think you can appreciate that uh, she's able to move uh, the tools again, but the amplitude is, is higher and she's now able to perform uh, dorsiflexion of the feet which was something she could not do anymore previously. So this is, of course, a, a, a single case report. We cannot take into account. Uh, I mean, this is not definitive evidence of, of the, of the uh, clinical benefit, but this is something really, uh, I mean, exciting, I would say. And then we, we now are now thinking about, uh, I mean, performing an additional and more well-designed uh, study. So this is a, a, a study that is planned to, to begin uh, late, uh, late this year or in the beginning of next year. So this is going to be a collaborative study done at my center 
and at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And this is going to be, uh, again, a, a, a placebo-controlled uh, clinical trial. Again, we're using a double-blind design where we're going to uh, explore the, the, the effects of non-invasive spinal cord modulation. So we're going to uh, basically follow the, the, the protocol that has been used for some time in the management of patients with Parkinson's disease. And we're, we hope to include a, a, a large cohort considering both uh, centers in Brazil. And this is going to be the design of the clinical trial. So patients are going to be submitted to, to active simulation and other group is going to be submitted to placebo, like a sham simulation. And we're going to have a, a washout period and then we're going to have the crossover. And the idea is to have the, the whole follow-up period along six months uh, in this clinical trial. So hopefully we're going to have more, uh, I mean, reliable data to really uh, show us whether this kind of approach is, is beneficial and safe to manage uh, 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 HSPs in general. So uh, I hope I, can, I, have, I have shown you some, some data that uh, uh, give us some lessons about the management of specificity in patient with HSP. So I think uh, at this point, we have three important conclusions to be, to be uh, considered. So the first one is that we need more studies. So we need to have, uh, I mean, uh, placebo-controlled studies, uh, well-designed clinical trials. We need to, to have really data that, that gives us definitive answers about the, the, the therapies. And of course, thinking that uh, HSPs are rare diseases, this is only going to be possible through collaboration, through, uh, I would say, international collaborations. And I think efforts uh, done by H SP, SP Foundation would be really important to, to, to gather researchers all over the world to, to uh, participate in that kind of uh, clinical efforts. The second conclusion, I think it's important to, to remind you, is that not every single patient with HSP has the same uh, clinical uh, phenotype. So some patients I, I see in, in my practice, uh, so the pattern of, of uh, leg weakness or specificity is different. So uh, we're going we're gonna, we're, we're gonna to need to have more, uh, I would say, uh, customized approaches. So depending on the particular patient, we're going to possibly uh, going to use uh, different medications. Uh, and, and this is something we need to take into account. And finally, uh, what, what begins to, to be clear, at least from these initial results using botulinum toxin and, and the other uh, uh, medication, the Z-clog, is that antispastic agents, they, they might be helpful, but uh, alone, uh, they might not be enough to obtain clinically meaningful gait improvement. So we're going to need to have, uh, I would say, uh, combined approaches to have to maximize the clinical improvement uh, we need to have uh, in terms of, of the gait, in terms of the, the function uh, in the end. So I think uh, this is my, my last slide. Uh, I'd like to, to really thank my research group at, at the University of Campinas. So this is uh, our, our, our clinical research team and some of our, our, our basic researchers. Uh, I'd like to, to thank our collaborators in Brazil and in the USA. And of course, our, our funding agencies that have been really uh, helpful to, to give us uh, funds to perform these, these studies. So I'd like to finish here. Again, I'd like to thank very much the, the, the chance of, of being here. And I'll be happy now to take any questions uh, that, that came out uh, after the talk. Well, um, I think we can just move forward because I've seen that uh, there are some questions that came out in the Q&A. Uh, I'll begin to address some of these questions. Um, well, so the very first one is that um, a question about uh, my perspective on large volume injection of stem cells to diminish the HSP symptoms now available at various clinics in the Caribbean. Well, you know, uh, I, personally, I personally do not have uh, uh, experience with stem cells uh, to manage uh, HSPs. Uh, uh, we got some, some basic research going on in our university. So this is, has been a, a very initial step. So we, we have been using cell models to, to evaluate the effects of, of stem cell therapies. But uh, so far, uh, we don't have data to, to, to support the use of stem cells to manage HSPs. 
uh, I think uh, we don't have publications, at least uh, uh, clinical clinical trials or, or a clinical case uh, series showing the, the, the efficacy of that kind of approach. So, so far, I would not recommend uh, that kind of approach, basically uh, only in, in a clinical clinical research setting uh, done in a, in a university or, or a research-based center. But otherwise, uh, I'm really not sure whether it's going to be safe or, or effective to manage HSP. Uh, this is my particular view at this point. Um, well, the second question, uh, this is, uh, come, comes from a patient with SPG7. And she, she, uh, the question is, why or how is it that when I have stress or not sleeping well, my specific and vibration in my legs is greatly increasing? Is it from inflammation? Uh, I, it seems to, to be happening more often. I have to use a cane. Is there anything I should do or try? Well, so uh, Leslie, thank you for your question. This is, uh, this is an important question. And this is something um, many of my patients uh, also complain. Well, uh, I think I, I, I show you in, in that cartoon where we could see the, the spinal cord uh, integration reflex. So what happens is that, um, that uh, spasticity, spasticity is basically a situation where that integration becomes abnormal. So it becomes a kind of hyperexcitable. And so many sensory stimuli uh, might lead to, to the uh, activation of the, of the spinal reflex. So, uh, for example, um, lack of sleep, pain, uh, uh, inadequate position of the limb. So these are, are, uh, these are all uh, uh, situations that might lead to this abnormal integration and, and, and worsening of specificity. So what I would tell you is whenever possible and, and you're able to identify the triggers to, to, worse, to worsen the, the symptom. So try to identify them and try, try to avoid that kind of, of trigger. And if, if the scenario involves, for example, as, as you told here, uh, a sleep, uh, sleep uh, phenomenon, perhaps using medications to improve your sleep. So sometimes using uh, that kind of medication like uh, sleep inducing uh, drugs they, they might help you to relieve that kind of symptom. Um, well, now we have a, a, another question. So uh, this is about my experience with electrical stimulation. Is it working for everybody? Well, um, so we, we do have now some experience uh, using electrical stimulation. Uh, I have both patients treated using surgical implants. Uh, this is the case I've shown you here in the presentation. So this patient with SPG4, she had a really remarkable response and uh, she's now underwent the surgical uh, pr procedure now, it, I think two years from now, and the, the positive results are, are still uh, going on. So this has been a long lasting effect. Uh, but most of our patients who have been treated uh, with electrical stimulation, they, they have undergone non-invasive uh, stimulation so we're now using this protocol, which is a protocol we have been using for some time for patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, we don't have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, long-term follow-up data at this point, but uh, I, can, I, can, I can remember of some of my patients that had a positive results. So many of them mentioned about uh, pain improvement. Some of them mentioned improvement in, in the sleep quality. And uh, some of them also reported uh, improvement in terms of gait and gait velocity. So we hope to have the, this clinical trial uh, in, uh, set in place uh, re uh, soon and hope to have uh, more conclusive data to show you uh, uh, in the near future. But uh, I'm really uh, optimistic about, about the, the, this neuromodulation approach, especially the non-invasive uh, approach because it's, it's much more easy to perform and it, it is something that patients can also do at home possibly. So this is something really interesting to investigate, I think. Um, uh, there is one additional question here. Um, this is about uh, how does HSP differ from cerebral palsy? So for a patient that was born with HSP and it hasn't been progressive, how can they now, how can they know they have HSP and not uh, cerebral palsy? Well, um, well, you know, this is something uh, interesting to, to, to address. So uh, 
We know that some uh, HSPs, uh, one of those is SPG3, for example, uh, they can have really uh, early, early onset. So one of my patients with SPG3A, I was able to see her with you know four to six weeks after birth, and she already had signs of, of, lower, of lower limb uh, uh, weakness and spasticity. So uh, from a clinical point of view, it's sometimes hard to, to differentiate between uh, cerebral palsy and, um, and, and some HSPs. But we have some uh, clinical clues. So one of those is when you have a positive family history, of course, this is something that we should take into account. The second point is that uh, in, in, in HSPs in general, uh, the, 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 the clinical uh, findings are basically restricted to, to the lower limbs. So we, we don't have uh, cognitive uh, uh, dysfunction or you know, you don't have uh, epilepsy which are some, uh, some uh, features that are quite frequent in patients with cerebral palsy. But in the end, whenever there is a, a doubt about the, the proper diagnosis in, in, in a particular patient, so we need to, to, to uh, perform uh, additional investigation and we need to perform genetic testing because this is gonna be the ultimate uh, 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 test that, that, that's gonna be able to, to solve the question. So uh, I, would, I would really recommend this, this situation. Um, well, there is one, one more conceptual question here. So um, uh, to define spasticity without using the word spastic. So uh, again, a good question. I'm sorry if I was not clear about this point. Um, so spasticity is a situation where we have increased muscle tone. So muscles look more tight and this interferes with the ability to perform movement. So uh, the knee looks tight and you cannot, for example, flex the knee, you cannot properly extend the knee. So this is what we see in, in, clinical, in clinical practice. So I hope it's now clear, but the idea behind specificity is, is the idea of increased muscle tone, increased muscle, uh, I mean, excessive muscle contractions that are in general not, um, not uh, requested. So it's an involuntary phenomenon. Um, well, uh, there is one additional question about if a patient in the U.S. take part in clinical studies. Well, you know, I, I would love to, to, to have a, a international collaboration so that we could include more patients. And I think this is something we could try to discuss. Uh, of course, there are, there are excellent centers in the U.S. and that would be able to, to, to take part in this collaboration. Perhaps SP Foundation could be, could be important to, to put us in, in, in contact with other researchers in, in, in America. And from my personal view, I would really love to have a, a larger cohorts and, and international uh, collaborations uh, in, that, in that studies that we have been doing. So uh, I hope you can do that. And, and uh, from, my, from my personal point of view, I, I, would, be, I would be willing to, to, to include additional patients and whatever. Um, well, uh, there is one uh, additional question. Um, well, it, uh, this is a patient that has an unknown variant on TechPR2, and she, she mentions that she has a lot of nerve pain and tremors, so all around the, the, the body. She mentions that botulinum toxin is, is helpful, but you know only partially, and the same, the same takes place with baclofen. So she complains about the, the, the beginning of the movement, which is, which is something limited. Well, uh, she, she, she asks about any ideas to discuss with my uh, physiatrist. Well, um, this is a tough question because um, it seems not to be a, a, a matter of uh, plasticity alone. So we're, we now have some, some uh, really nice imaging data showing that in addition to this plasticity and to the, to the weakness, uh, we now begin to see that some patients with uh, HSP, they also have a, a, a cognitive dysfunction uh, related to the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, gait, uh, gait uh, motor plan. So this is something that is similar to what happens in Parkinson's disease. So uh, at some point, a patient with HSP and Parkinson's disease they somehow they, they, they lose that automatic control 
uh, that, that is important to, to the begin of the gate process. Um, I'm not aware of any, uh, I mean, clinical trials or any medication that targets that, that kind of dysfunction, but I would favor uh, a discussion that involves rehabilitation. So we have some, some protocols uh, that, that have been in place now for some years for Parkinson's disease that target uh, this kind of dysfunction, which is called um, um, freezing of gait. So there are, there are some, some uh, interventions. Some of them use kind of a feedback uh, uh, protocols uh, that might be helpful. And I would encourage you to, to discuss this point with your uh, uh, physiatrist and, and your physical therapy team. So that would be a, a, a guess based in Parkinson's disease, but I, I believe that it might be some, somehow helpful you know, at this point. Well, uh, one additional question. Um, so, uh, so this is a patient that mentions that he uses baclofen to alleviate spasms to, to permit sleep at night. But is there any benefit of using baclofen during the day to diminish the sleep? Well, this is a, this is a good question. Um, I personally uh, use it for some of my patients. So in, in the daytime period, well, the benefit is, is really, uh, I mean, uh, different from, from patient to patient. So I got some patients that really uh, benefit from, from daytime use of baclofen, but for others, uh, there is no benefit and, and they actually complain of, of drowsiness because of the medication. So um, it's, it's not easy to, to, to say, I mean, but I would definitely at least try, uh, perform a, a try using, uh, begin with a slow taper of the dose uh, in, in, during the daytime. But I think it might be helpful and, and it, it, might be, it might be safe also. So uh, I, would, I, would, I would basically uh, recommend at least trying uh, for some time and using this uh, slow taper. I, I, it it might, might be beneficial. Um, well, um, Dr. Franca, yeah. I had a question. Could we find the essential oil that you mentioned in the United States? Well, um, so um, I'm really not, not sure because um, I think this medication is only uh, uh, available in Brazil. I'm, I'm really not sure. But I can definitely ask the, the company that, that, that's, that, uh, that sells the medication. And I definitely can, can give you this answer a, a, a later on because uh, I'm really not sure about the use. At least here in Brazil, this medication is considered a, 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 um, a kind of a natural medicine. So I think it's, 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 uh, it's sold as an over-the-counter medication. So it's not a really uh, a complex uh, process to have it, it, it here in Brazil, but I'm not really sure if it's available in other countries. I can check this and I can give you this. This isn't this uh, question, Greg. I was diagnosed with HSP4, recently complicated with neuropathy. During waking hours, the neuropathy is slight, but upon waking, the burning in my face and lower arms severe, unbearable, persists until I arise. It takes time, any help for this miserable com complication. Well, Sherry, thank you for the question. So we, we by the way, we had a, a publication a couple of years ago, looking at the non-motor features in, H in SPG4. And indeed, pain was one of the most frequent manifestations. Was one of the most frequent manifestations in SPG4. So, in our cohort here, more than half of patients had had pain, and in most of the times, uh, pain was was neuropathic uh, pain in nature. So, taking into account the, the, this data, so I would really favor using uh, medications that have been uh, approved for for a neuropathic pain. Uh, that would be my initial approach to you, certainly. But I would also uh, really think about using, perhaps in combination, uh, neuromodulation. So neuromodulation uh, uh, is something interesting. And there are some, there are some uh, studies showing that the, the combination of neuromodulation, especially non-invasive neuromodulation uh, and, 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 and pain medications, the, it, it, we could see uh, more, uh, more intense uh, positive results. So that would be my, my suggestion for you at this point. Okay, Dr. Franca, I had another question that was mailed in to us. My daughter is 25 years old and suffered with spastic paraplegia. She was 18 when we found out 
but now her walking is getting worse and she walks with a walker. My question is one, how long will it take to do a human trial? And what kind of patient will qualify for human trial? Two, once my daughter completely is once my daughter is completely paralyzed, there will be a chance that she is qualified for the treatment. And three, can you explain about the treatment? Will the gene will it be gene therapy or stem cells? Well, you know, I think this is a, a complex question. I'll try to 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 address all, all, all points raised here. So, um, well, first, uh, in terms of of clinical trials, so human clinical trials, uh, I think we have two different scenarios. So the first one is about a symptomatic therapy. So that would be there there would be interventions, medications, or you know, uh, devices that would would target symptoms of HSPs. This is what we, we, uh, we have seen here. So antispastic drugs for pain, for, for cramps and whatever. So that kind of, 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 of therapy, I think it's coming close. So uh, we, we have seen here the very first clinical trial with botulinum toxin. And I think this is something that we're gonna see, I think more often in the coming years. The other situation, which would be our, I mean, our really uh, target, would be to, to find disease modifying treatments. So treatments that would really target the underlying cause of each HSP. So I think this is, I mean, uh, uh, not so close because uh, we are now beginning to understand in more detail the, the mechanisms behind each HSP, HSPs, but at least for some of them, like SPG4, SPG3A, SPG11, uh, SPG5, for example, we now know much more about the disease mechanisms. And we know, for example, if we need to, uh, I mean, turn genes on or turn genes off, for example, we need to upregulate or downregulate genes. So knowing that, that uh, mechanism behind the disease is the very first step that we need to know in order to move and, and come to, for example, gene therapy clinical trials, uh, like using ASOs or whatever. So uh, I believe that we're going to see this in the coming years. I cannot, I mean, predict how long it's going to take. My guess at this point is that SPG5 would perhaps be the first one because we now have some more uh, information about the disease mechanism, the, the cholesterol dysfunction that we have in this condition. But uh, hopefully we're going to have this, I would say, maybe in the, in the next five or five years or so. So this is the point. Uh, the last question is about once the patient e is already severely disabled, uh -huh. if we're, we're going to be able to have some improvement. Well, uh, uh, thinking about the, the symptomatic therapies, of course, the, the, the prospect is, would not be that good because we, we're going to have dysfunction. But thinking about disease modifying therapies, I think we could do, we, we could have uh, improvement. Of course, this is going to this is going to be uh, this is going to depend on the on the medication. It's going to be, this is going to depend on, on the, the clinical studies that, that, that are going to be uh, performed. But at least from a theoretical point of view, this is going to be possible. And, and uh, trying to, to, to bring to, to, to the scenario, the comparison we had with other diseases, for example, SMA, which is, has been a, 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 a kind of a, a prototype disease in, 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 neuro, in neurogenetics. So we began to see that even kids with SMA type 1 or type 2 with long-standing disease, once they begin to receive these, these new class of medications like gene therapies, like ASO, whatever, we begin to see real improvement. So um, I think it's my, 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 my final answer is that yes, if we have effective disease modifying therapies, this is going to be helpful not only for patients in the early stages of the disease, but also for patients in the late stages of the disease. Yeah. Okay, Andrea Rosenblum back in the, the Q&A. She says, any studies using the BioNES L300? Well, um, I'm not aware of any studies using that, that system particularly, but you know, once it delivers uh, uh, electrical simulation in, in the same, in the same uh, design that we need, so uh, the, the, the amplitude of the stimuli, the frequency of the stimuli, so it might be helpful. So I'm not aware of any clinical uh, trials or studies using that 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 uh, system but 
it, it might be it might it might be helpful. And he says, my spasms come mostly at night after eight o'clock and rarely in the day. What does this mean? Well, you know, this is something uh, uh, which is quite typical for HSP. So uh, in general, the, the spasms uh, and, and the, the increased muscle tone, I mean, are more evident mm -hmm. uh, during, during uh, the nighttime. So the reason for that is, is not clear at this point. There are some, there are some uh, ideas behind that. So possibly one is the, the, the temperature that goes down that would lead to increased muscle tone. This is one, one possibility. There is also some discussions about the, the, the uh, uh, hormonal uh, uh, secretion of, of cortisol and some other hormones that might influence the, the, the tone of the muscles. But you know, it's not really clear what is the main reason for that. But the the the, the fact is that this is something really frequent, and this is this is uh, the reason why we sometimes prescribe antispastic medications uh, at night, because this is the, the 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 moment where the symptoms usually get more bothersome, interfere with sleep, and this is the reason for that. We've gotten several questions about neuromodulation working on the bladder and the bowel. Would you address that? Yes, so this is something uh, important. We now have some, uh, I would say quite reliable uh, data um, showing that neuromodulation is uh, effective to manage neurogenic bladder. So there are now some protocols that involve the placement of electrodes in the lower, lower limb muscles. It, it's, it's quite interesting because you do not place the electrodes really in, in, inside or close to the bladder, but they actually are placed in, in some of the lower limb nerves like the tibialis anterior uh, nerve. And this, led, this leads to, to uh, some improvement in, in, in bladder function. So, uh, the, 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 the answer is yes, so it's, it's an effective option. Of course, every patient needs to be evaluated, needs to have a formal urological evaluation, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, a surgical evaluation, but at least for some of, of, of the patients, that this is something that, sh that could be considered as an, uh, um, as an option to manage a, a neurogenic better. Michael Kane brought up a really good question that I had too. When you say that, that it was approved, who's doing the approving? Is it FDA in the USA only? Well, you know, when I meant to say approved, I, I meant to say uh, in the US, that, that would mean FDA approval. And in Brazil would be the FDA equivalent, which is called Anvisa. So th th that would be the... the that would be the, the, the idea. So when I mentioned, for example, that botulinum toxin is approved, so it has uh, a lot, I would say some uh, uh, indications that are formally approved by the FDA. So to manage, for example, cervical dystonia, to manage spastic after stroke, specific after stroke, to manage, for example, uh, some headaches, so these are, are, are uh, situations where we have a formal approval by FDA. When we come to spastic uh, paraplegia, regardless of the etiology, that means uh, after a spinal cord injury, after a multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, a genetic disease like HSP. So this is not a situation where we have a formal approval for a botulinum toxin. Okay. Um... He asked too, is there any explanation for the large dropout rate from 150 to 35? Was the cohort, cohort chosen only from Unicamp? Well, yeah, this is a good question. So actually uh, we, we, we screened 153 individuals for the botulinum toxin trial. And uh, almost half of, of, of that cohort was, uh, was not able to be included in the trial. So the reasons for that were multiple, but the, the main reason was that we, we, we chose as, uh, to include in this trial only patients with pure HSP. So for example, patients with uh, complex phenotypes, 
I mean, patients that had, for example, ataxia, that had um, peripheral neuropathy, that had you know any other uh, associated manifestation that could interfere with gait abilities. So these patients were, were not included initially. So this is something important because we need to take into account that some patients with HSP, they have uh, the, the, I would say, the, the, the upper motor neuron dysfunction. That means they have spasticity in the lower limbs, but they can also have, for example, uh, lower motor neuron dysfunction. That is a peripheral neuropathy or, or lower motor neuron uh, dysfunction. And in that situation, for example, botulinum toxin might be, uh, might be uh, I mean, uh, might not be that safe. So you, you, we can see, for example, uh, increasing weakness uh, in that kind of patient. And so this was the reason why we, I mean, restricted the, 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 the analysis to this small, smaller cohort. In your opinion, is a massage gun useful or harmful for use for someone with spasticity? Um, so massaging? This is, a this massage is a gun. So do you know what that is? It looks like a drill, but it 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 pounds. It's, it gives you a deep tissue massage. Well, this is something I, I'm really not uh, familiar okay. with really. So, uh, well, could you address any way a deep tissue massage? Do you know that? Well, you know, I think in general, uh, stretching exercises, um, uh, uh, in general, physical therapy, is something I, re I really would recommend to everybody with HSP. And massage is something that uh, many of my patients actually do during the, the, the rehabilitation programs. Many of them uh, feel like it, it's something positive for them, especially in terms of relieving uh, uh, pain, relieving uh, 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 sometimes spasms. And I would, I would, I would favor, I would favor uh, uh, using that kind of approach as an additional measure to 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 improve the symptoms. Okay, uh, what at home electric stimulation device do you recommend? What should be the setting, the intensity, yada, yada, yada. Well, you know, there are, it, it really depends a little bit on each patient because uh, the protocol we use here, so what, what we do is that uh, we place the, the electrodes so close to the spinal cord, and we also place a recording electrode in lower limb muscles. And then we begin to set up the, 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 the stimuli, so the amplitude, the frequency, when we begin to see the response in the lower limb uh, uh, muscle. So... So it really depends. So for example, if a patient is more obese, so it, it, it's, we, we in general need higher uh, uh, stimul stimulation frequencies and amplitudes because we cannot reach properly the, the spinal cord in that kind of situation. So there is not a general number or general setup that is done to everybody. It really depends on the patient. So what we, we have been doing here is that the initial protocols are really uh, done at the hospital, at the center, we need to set up this depending on each patient's uh, situation. And then once it's, it's really uh, defined, it's clear the, the, the ideal protocol for each patient, then it, this can be done eventually at home. But I, I would really uh, uh, recommend that every patient would discuss this with the neurologist, with the physiatrist, or you know, to have this initial setup done uh, under medical uh, supervision. Okay. Oh, please tell us the progress being made in genetic editing and CRISPR technologies for actually curing HSP. Well, you know, this is something that, that is really promising. We begin to see some marvelous findings in, in different diseases, genetic diseases especially. So uh, earlier this year, we, have, we, we, we saw the very first clinical trial using CRISPR-Cas9 for, for amyloidosis which is something that we would not expect uh, in such a small time frame. But thinking about uh, HSPs, I'm really not aware of any clinical uh, trials. I mean, using that kind of genetic, genomic editing approaches. We, we do have some, some basic scientists working on that kind of approach. Um, the results have been, some of them have been published uh, lately. So SPG11, SPG4, but I think we, we're still going to have some time before this can 
can be uh, translated into clinical trials uh, to be tested in, in, in patients. So it's promising. It's possibly, uh, I mean, effective because, I mean, uh, it has been it has been positive for for uh, similar diseases. But uh, I, I I believe that we still need some time before this can be uh, 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 set in place in, in in clinical trials. And then finally, Zarmina has a question for you about SPG eleven about any updates and she also says medication and i cannot pronounce that will help mm -hmm. for spasticity why cannot prescribe in america well you know this medication it's called miglustat so this is a medication that has been in clinical practice for some years in europe and in brazil so it it has a, a formal approval to be used in a condition called Neiman Peak type C disease, which is a genetic disease uh, that is uh, that, that that is involved uh, that, that is related to uh, dysfunction in lysosomal metabolism. Well, there is a um, there is a single a clinical study that has been published. I mean, not clinical, a preclinical study that has been published in animal models of SPG11. And this study had, I mean, uh, positive results showing that this medication might be uh, effective uh, in, in, in SPG-11. So the reason for that is that SPG-11 is a lysosomal disease. So even though the manifestation is as a spastic paraplegia, so the, the underlying mechanisms is some, somehow similar to this uh, other disease, new peak type C. Well, so we have this, this data, but it's, it's really a very initial uh, result. So this is a preclinical study. Uh, of course, uh, since the medication is already in clinical use, so of course we, 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 we think it's, 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 a, it's an option to be used. But again, I would definitely uh, favor that we could, for example, design a clinical trial, perform this in a controlled setting, so that we could really know if it's worth, if it's useful or not. So at this point, it's a, it's a promising approach, but we don't have conclusive data so far. Okay, well, that is all the questions that I came across. So if there was anything that I skipped, I'm sorry, and that you'll, you'll have the transcript, we'll send that to you. Okay. Yeah, you know, if there's any additional questions, so I'll be happy to, to, to answer them and, and I can give you a feedback later on. So well, any, I know that one person wanted to have um, any information about the, uh, the neuromodulation on the bladder. Okay, okay. So I, I can, I can address, address the, 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 this, these remaining issues later on and I can, I can answer that. Yeah. Yes, Tina, thank you so very much. I appreciate everyone working together and getting all of this information out. Doctor, we certainly want to appreciate your time and energy in putting this information together for us and doing the presentation. So I'm sure if you could see everyone clapping and thanking you for um, your assistance this afternoon, uh, we very much appreciate that. And we look forward to hearing from you perhaps in the future. I wanna tell you guys right now, as you see popping up on your screen right in front of my face is our poll, which is a survey. Uh, we want you guys to take a moment to go through those questions, simple questions, be kind. Uh, you know, we're all trying to learn technology. And now that we've been doing this a year, we seem like we think we know what we're doing, but occasionally technology just does not like us and we just have to make the best of what we can do. But I wanted to tell you guys that, you know, we, we had uh, the doctor provide uh, answers to the questions. We appreciate you guys putting them in the Q&A section so that we could find those quickly. We could be able to address those. What we're really hoping is that in the future, we're going to have the doctor on and then let him um, answer more questions uh, so that we have that information available on our YouTube channel. And we want to remind you that as soon as we are able to download uh, the video that we're recording, then we will have that information available on the YouTube channel. So let me save you an email. You don't have to email, and email us and ask us when are we going to do it. As soon as this gets processed, 
which, you know, it takes a little while for all that technology to do its magic, then we'll go through and make sure that there's not any blips or there's not any problems. We'll edit it just ever so slightly so that it's easier to hear it and to see it. But we will put that information up just as quickly, absolutely as quickly as possible. So save yourself the email from asking us, but we will have that online. Uh, and then please remind yourself that all of our videos from previous presentations are also online. So go back and review some of those. Go back and spend some time looking at some of those questions. Then if you have additional questions, then you know, bring those back to us and we'll be glad to see what we could do to get the those answered. And then I want to remind you that um, October the 16th, save the date, October 16th, and then also uh, November the 13th, save the date. But on the 16th, we're going to have Dr. Hiroshi Mitsumoto. He's going to come on and join us and do the same kind of presentation. This will be our sixth series for the year. Uh, I think we're going to round it out at the 7th uh, on November the 13th. But um, and then we'll see. We'll probably take off the month of December and then maybe come back in January. But I also wanted to kind of give you guys heads up since you're on screen with us today. And I think we had about almost 200 people ready register with us. And so thank you very much for registering and being a part of this. But come July of 2022, we are planning an in-person conference. So I'm going to be sending out a save the day little blurb on social media because, you know, we all love social media. But let me tell you that the best and the first place to find it is on our website. We will always put all information about what we know, what we're doing, and how we're going to do it. We'll put that on our website. So please go. We've updated the website, but it will be in June the 22nd through the 24th of 2022. In, I mean, July, July, we've normally had it in June, but it's in July 2022, 2024 of 2022 in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're going to come together. Uh, at that time, uh, we're going to look at some type of uh, online presentation, but we're going to also uh, begin to have an in-person. So I wanted to tell you guys about that. Um, I think our poll is still kind of going, so I'm just trying to give you guys enough time that you can answer the things that you need to have answered. It looks like it's just about to wrap up, so you guys Please fill out that, give us some feedback. We certainly want you guys to volunteer to be a part of the committee structures that we've put together. Uh, whatever your uh, love and interest is in your day-to-day -day lives, uh, we probably have a committee and we would really love for you to participate. We've had some great fundraisers over the summer. We're going to be looking at doing some other fundraisers in the future. Uh, we got ways that we're wanting to market and get the word out about the foundation and all of us, you know, we're all one big family. So I want to thank all of you for coming on today and participating with us and asking those questions. I think that's what we've got to do is we've got to find a way to get uh, questions answered. These are our lives. We're living this and we want to find a way to find a cure. And that is the bottom line. We want to find a cure and we want to be done with these motor neuron diseases and live a normal life. So thank you all very much. I think our poll is about to end at this point. And please join us on uh, October the 16th, one o'clock central, as we have normally been doing these. If we do something different, we'll for sure let you know. Rem uh, remind yourself to go back onto the website, register for the next conference. It's a free registration. And uh, we'll continue to provide you this information all that we can. So thank you very much. We appreciate you. We love every one of you. And you guys have a great afternoon.